Computer. Okay, recording. We'll give everyone a minute to join. Um, but as you guys are coming in, I always find it interesting to hear from you what specifically brought you to this webinar and what you're hoping to learn. That helps me as I'm going through just know what to address. Also, if you want to share where you're where you're coming in from, that is also always interesting to see. Charlotte NC, number one, me too. Very cool. All over the map. Another Charlotte NC. Arizona, California, New York, Maine, Missouri, Idaho. Very nice. Lockport, New York, doing lots of bike riding in the summer. See, we've got a son who's a multiple sport athlete. Yep. Former collegiate athlete, transitioning habits to the everyday athlete. We will talk about that. Awesome. We'll give everyone just another minute to join. All right, cool. Well, let's go ahead and get started. We've got a lot of material to cover today. Um, so we'll just jump in, get my screen set up. Okay, great. Well, hello and welcome everybody. My name is Lindsay Cosma. I'm the director of marketing here at Food Smart, where we connect people to nutrition support, including personal dietitian and daily tools that help make eating well simple. Um, I also hold a master of nutrition science and policy from Tufts University and have spent a considerable amount of time both academically, personally, and professionally, helping people understand how to use sports nutrition to fuel their bodies and support their goals. So that's what we're going to get into today in the context of nutrition for the everyday athlete. And the everyday athlete, by the way, is someone who, anyone who lives an active lifestyle. And this can mean going to the gym a couple of times a week. It can be biking, participating in endurance activities like running or swimming, playing a sport like tennis or soccer, or even working a really physical job. Even someone who isn't all that active today, but is looking to become more active will benefit from the material that we're covering today. So this is really for, really for everybody. Before we jump in, um, I want to let you know that by attending this webinar today, you will have a chance to win our $250 prize of your choice. So that's either a $250 Amazon gift card or both a Fitbit Versa and a glass meal prep set, which is perfect for our topic today. Um, all you have to do to book to enter to win is book a visit with a dietitian um, by tomorrow. 418 using the code athlete when you bit when you book. So visits cost as low as zero dollars depending on your health insurance, which you can check at the time of scheduling. And yeah, I encourage you all to, to take a second and, and book that visit. Um, my colleague Hannah will drop a link for you in the chat that you can use um, to to book. Yep, Holly, I see your question. We get this question a lot. If you're already seeing a dietitian or you already have a visit scheduled, you can still book your next visit, your next follow-up visit, um, and use that code to enter and you'll be entered to win. So take a second and check that out. You can drop the link in the chat. All right. Did we get the link? There we go. Okay. Thanks, Anna. All right. So on the agenda today, we are going to break down this idea of sports nutrition 
or in other words, fueling your body appropriately for an athletic pursuit that you have in mind. So to do that, we're going to review the fundamentals of nutrition and break them down into their parts. So calories and nutrients specifically, we're going to talk about how to reframe food as fuel, and then we're going to learn the importance of building muscle. Then we'll spend a good amount of time digging into how to apply these concepts to people, three scenarios of people with different goals. So we have a weightlifter, we'll have a newbie, and we'll have an endurance athlete. And then we'll talk about some practical considerations and a Q&A to round it out. Great. So looking at the building blocks next, calories and nutrients. So we're going to start with nutrients, and these are the what that makes up our diet. So nutrients are any substances that are essential for growth, development, or overall health. Um, these can further be broken down into both macronutrients and micronutrients. Micronutrients, as the name suggests, are things that, like vitamins and minerals, are essential but are needed in smaller quantities. So macronutrients are required by the body in, reg in relatively large amounts um, in contrast to micronutrients. And there are three categories here. So fats, carbohydrates, and protein. Carbohydrates we have primarily, it's, it's the primary energy source for the body. So it's found in foods like grains, fruits, and vegetables. Proteins are important for building and repairing tissues as well as supporting immune function and hormone production. And those are found in foods like meat, dairy, beans, and nuts. And then fats, <clears throat> excuse me, are essential for energy storage, insulation, and the absorption of fat-soluble vitamins. And those are found in foods like oils, nuts, seeds, and fatty fish. Then we have calories, which are the way that we measure how much energy our food or those macronutrients that we just talked about, how much energy they provide. And when we think about calories, we're usually talking about them in terms of daily caloric intake. So maybe you've noticed on food labels that are based on a 2000 calorie per day diet, um, which is just a point of reference, not an individual recommendation, but calories on their own are not really the whole picture. Calories are not created equal. For example, you can have 100 calories of sugar, which will react very differently in the body than say 100 calories of steak, even though it may be providing the same amount of energy. So while you can achieve energy balance just by focusing on calories, when you're thinking about overall health, in including athletic performance, it's really important to consider the actual foods that you're eating rather than just the calories themselves. So we'll touch on that a little bit more in a little bit more depth um, here in a second. So that said, we are talking about athletic goals. So muscle building, body recomposition, et cetera, and calories are still an important part of that conversation. I don't want to spend a ton of time on this slide, but I do want to include it for reference. And if you want to screenshot it or come back to it later, you can follow these equations and kind of calculate things for yourself. But um, this is essentially showing equations that you can use along with numerous there are lots of numerous online calculators that do this as well, um, but they calculate your daily calorie needs um, as a, a point of reference. So notice I say they it's a point of reference. This is a starting point. There are tons of factors that can actually affect your actual caloric needs, like genetics, health conditions, if you have any illnesses going on. Um, to really figure this out, you would want to actually monitor your usual intake for a week or two, see where you really are, and assess whether your weight is changing, so going up or down, or staying the same. And that would help you determine whether you're currently eating at what we call maintenance, where your weight isn't changing at all, um, or you're in a deficit, so you're eating like below maintenance and so your weight might be going down or in a surplus. So you're eating above maintenance and your weight might be going up. By the way, none of these are wrong or right. Um, they all really depend on your goals, which we will, we will touch on. So I mentioned that when thinking about our diet, it is important to consider both calories for energy and nutrients for health. And understanding how the two relate to one another can help us do that. So each of the three macronutrients provide different calorie amounts per gram. We have carbohydrates, which, which provide four kilocalories per gram, which is the same thing as calories um, in this conversation. Protein, which provides four calories per gram, and fat, which provides nine calories per gram. And this is telling us that fat really is more energetically dense than carbs or protein. 
which means that we can get the same amount of calories from a smaller portion of fat as compared to a larger portion of carbs, for example. So what this picture here is illustrating. So you'll see the tiny amount of cheese rather or compared to a large amount of radishes or okra um, and certainly potatoes. So this is not to say that one is better than the other. By definition of macronutrients, remember we need all three. But this is helpful to keep in mind when we think about structuring our diet against our goals. So for example, if our goal was weight gain um, and we were in a slight calorie deficit or surplus, we would already be eating a lot of food and we may want to prioritize fats over carbohydrates to get those extra calories without feeling prohibitively full. And the opposite would be true then for weight loss, where we would maybe prioritize higher volume foods alongside fats and proteins to stay satiated. So what is the correct ratio of nutrients and calories for me? You might ask, what makes the optimal diet? Well, we're going to touch on a few examples for our everyday athletes, um, but this is really going to be different for everybody. It depends, like I said, on so many different things from the activity type that you're doing, the activity level, health conditions you may have, or managing food allergies. Um, all of these things contribute to the nuances of what your individual diet should look like. And we did an entire webinar on this actually earlier in the year, but there is really no one diet that is going to be the best for building muscle or losing weight. It's very personal. But here are some basic guidelines that to, you could follow um, as a starting point, as well as a few other things to consider when you're thinking about making it personal. So a couple of good guidelines, um, balance is best. So including all of those macronutrients, fats, carbs, and protein. Hydration is key, staying hydrated. We know that. Um, prioritizing whole foods over processed when possible. This really is in here to ensure that you're getting enough fiber. So it's just a good kind of easy baseline to address that. Seeking variety. So this is thinking about micronutrients. Now, um, different colors in your vegetables and fruits indicate different micronutrient composition. So it's an easy way to kind of spot, hey, am I getting a variety of, of micronutrients? And then again, including fiber, both soluble and insoluble. Some other factors to consider it are focusing on how you actually feel when you're eating a certain way. Do you feel better when you're eating more carbs or fats um, or certain foods versus others? Pay attention to those things. Also notice your digestion. Um, how is that responding to the diet that you're following or the foods that you're eating? Um, consider your medical needs, of course, and then remembering that all foods can fit. So it's really just a matter of amount, type, and timing. How much are you eating? What types of foods are you eating? And then how are you and when are you eating those things? And it can be really helpful when trying to figure this out for yourself to have someone like a dietitian there to help guide you to try things out, to make adjustments and to help you stay accountable. So just a reminder, you can meet with a dietitian over the phone. You can even meet on nights and weekends um, for as low as your dollars, depending on your health insurance. So Schedule that visit, use the code ATHLETE, and you'll be entered to win our, our $250 drawing. All right. So reframing food as fuel. Rather than following just rules and philosophies that feel restrictive for no reason, like particular diets, I really do find it helpful to think about food as we've just discussed, as their parts, as calories and micro macronutrients. This really allows for endless flexibility when we talk about diet as well as control, which becomes important as we start to talk about sports nutrition. So with all that in mind, we have a helpful framework that when we think about food as fuel specifically um, for an active life cycle style that we can follow. So depending on your goals, you can assess, you know, how much energy or calories does my body need for the activities that I'm doing? You can ask what nutrients does my body need and in what amounts? And then what timing is appropriate to consider based on my activity type and level? And one really important note here, you know, I'm breaking this down so that we can have this shared definition so that when we look at some of these more specific examples and situations against performance goals, um, we will be on the same page about how we're applying these concepts to those scenarios. This in no way diminishes other valid influences uh, that determine what we eat, like pleasure and celebration and the importance of food and culture and community. So with that said, we can talk about building muscle. So before getting into the specific examples, um, we do have a couple slides on building muscle specifically. 
because building muscle is likely pretty relevant um, regardless of your particular athletic goals. So I want to talk about why muscle is important and how we build it. All right. So why muscle is important. Muscle supports the scaffolding of our bodies, um, our joints, our bones, our tendons, uh, and it improves stability and function. And that's important for day-to-day -day life. It's also important as we talk about athletic performance. Um, it's just really essential. It's all over our body for a reason. It holds everything together. Muscle is movement. It helps us move. Again, day-to-day -day function, um, really important for that as well as any athletic pursuits. It also boosts metabolism. So muscle cells are very metabolically active, which means that they burn more calories while at rest than other cells. Um, so the more muscle you have, the more metabolically active your body is. So that can be helpful. Um, more muscle is actually correlated with longevity. It is a predictor of longevity and um, it's important specifically as we age. And then it also improves metabolic health overall. So muscle tissue is involved in glucose metabolism and insulin sensitivity, which is important for keeping blood sugar stable, managing things like diabetes or prediabetes, um, and keeping everything in check there. Plus, as we age, I mentioned it's important for our longevity, but as we age, we actually lose three to 5% of our muscle mass each decade over the age of 30. So that's barring any activity that we're doing to build or maintain muscle, but just kind of left to its own devices without actively pursuing those things, our body is going to lose a little bit of muscle as we age. Um, but the good news is that you can actually build muscle at any age. So you could be 90 years old and it is possible to build muscle. Most people don't do that when they're 90, but it's theoretically possible. So let's talk about how you might build muscle. So building muscle, like building really most other things, actually requires some kind of raw material or substrate, in this case nutrition, and then some kind of force to lay the bricks, if you will. So the raw materials would be eating enough calories and eating enough protein. Now, eating enough calories is essential for muscle growth because it provides the necessary energy and nutrients for muscle protein synthesis. So that's building the muscle, muscle repair, and then also muscle growth. It also ensures that enough energy is available so that hormones are balanced, including having enough adequate um, growth hormone, and it supports recovery, which is an essential part of muscle building as well. Now, the force to make that change happen would be some kind of progressive stimulus that initiates small tears in that muscle that, assuming adequate calories and protein, are going to be repaired over and over again, and that helps you increase muscle size and strength. Now, this force can be applied um, by progressive overload, which in the gym might look like increasing some elements of your workout, like the amount of weight you're moving, the reps you're doing, the sets you're doing, or the time that you're performing an exercise. It could also involve just improving performance on something like bike sprints or increasing the time that you're performing a weight-bearing activity like rock climbing. So you can get really creative with how you are pursuing this progressive stimulus over time and assuming that you're eating enough food and enough protein, that leads to building muscle. All right, so now we are going to spend a good deal of time looking at these three different examples of everyday athletes who have different goals and apply the nutrition principles that we've learned as well as some others to their training to help them maximize performance and achieve those goals. So our three athletes are going to be our weightlifter, our newbie, and our endurance athlete. So let's meet our athletes. First, we have Wayne the weightlifter. He is a 43-year-old male. He weight trains three to four times per week. He has been following a consistent program for about a year and a half. He plays tennis occasionally um, and bikes here and there. He's been a little bit inconsistent with his nutrition and tends to undereat when he is stressed. And he's noticed his progress stall. So his goal is really to get that progress back up and keep continually building muscle and improving his performance at the gym. Next, we have Nina the newbie. She is a 33-year-old female, occasionally attends workout classes, but hasn't really followed a structured program consistently for more than a few weeks at a time. 
she feels though, like she's tried everything. She spent a lot of money and time going to these classes and she just doesn't really seem to see the results. She also works a desk job all day. So her goal is actually um, to lose some fat and also to build some muscle so that she looks lean and toned. And then we have Trixie, the triathlete. Trixie is a 50 year old female. She, as I said, is a triathlete competing in various races every few months. Um, she goes for distance runs as a part of her training three to four times per week. And she also lifts weights here and there and does Pilates maybe one or two times per week. So her specific goals are improving triathlon performance specifically. She wants to increase her running or improve her running time. All right. So let's talk about Wayne first. Now, as I said, he's been following a structured program for a good amount of time. Um, he seems to have his gym routine down. Initially, he did see some progress. He's been pretty inconsistent with his diet, and he tends to undereat when he's stressed, and his progress is stalled. So with his goal of building more strength and muscle, we can look at a few different nutritional considerations for Wayne. So because he wants to build muscle, like we learned, he is going to want to be sure he has enough energy, and that's either his calories are either at maintenance or at a surplus. And remember, we learned to calculate that. Um, but within those calories, he's going to really want to prioritize protein. So looking to get about one to 1.2 grams per pound of body weight, or about 35% of his calories per day, and also spacing that protein consumption out. So this varies from person to person. It's not a hard and fast rule, but the body generally doesn't absorb more than 30 to 50 grams of protein at one time. So this depends on your size and other factors, but spacing out your protein not only helps you stay full and satiated throughout the day, but it also ensures that you're making the most of what you're consuming. Now, think about timing. There's no rule about whether you should or should not eat before training. If it's a really hard workout, you can eat eating something small and including maybe a carbohydrate can help you ensure stable blood sugar and also improve performance. So say you're going to go for some personal records or you're going to lift really heavy today, eating ahead of time could be a good idea in that scenario. On the flip side, working out fasted has been shown to improve fat prioritization and metabolic flexibility. So there's a time and a place for this too. Um, and you can incorporate both into your training and see how you feel on either. And, you know, they're just strategies that you can employ depending on the activity that you're doing. Now, it is important to refeed after a workout. And the kind of general rule here is consuming a four to one ratio of protein to carbohydrate. That helps promote protein synthesis, remember that building of muscle and recovery. It also replenishes glycogen stores and helps your energy. So glycogen stores are the storage form of carbohydrates in the body, and they are stored in the muscle and the liver. And the body uses glycogen in the muscle during your workouts so that you, so you want to replenish those stores, right? So that would be after um, his, his training sessions. And then some other considerations, you know, if Wayne wants to prioritize muscle, muscle growth, he's going to want to maintain that progressive overload training and minimize heavy endurance cardio, which depletes glycogen pretty, pretty easily. And I say heavy endurance cardio, so he's not going to want to be training like our endurance athlete that we'll talk about, but he is going to be want, want to kind of maintain general cardiovascular health by keeping that fitness high, maybe prioritizing, um, something called non-activity, uh, thermogenesis, which is back in that equation earlier. Those are one of the components that you can control. And that's going to be how much you're generally moving throughout the day. So he could incorporate more walking. He could take the stairs and steps. He could do zone two cardio. Um, and, you know, the other thing for Wayne would be focusing on reducing stress and focusing on getting sleep as well as mobility to aid in his overall performance. The other thing to note about Wayne is the longer um, you lift consistently, the harder it can become to see that progress. So he's not going to see those considerable jumps that he may have seen um, in weight um, or size that he saw at the beginning of his program a year and a half ago. Um, so, you know, it could look like changing things up a little bit, adding in some more functional training or body weight exercises while ensuring he's still lifting comprehensively, um, that can change the stimulus sometimes just enough so that he could boost progress a little bit. So that could be another thing, um, for him to consider. All right. 
Next, we have Nina the newbie. So unlike Wayne, Nina has not been following any kind of structured plan. She has attended a lot of workout classes and she's joined gyms, but nothing really seems to stick for more than a month or so. So while she feels pretty active and she spends a lot of time and money on these classes, she is not really seeing results and she's pretty frustrated by that. Um, she is not following any kind of specific diet and she does enjoy a couple glasses of wine to wind down at the end of each day. Uh, and her goals are to finally get fit and put her effort towards something that will actually work. Specifically, she wants to tone up and lose a little bit of body fat while gaining some muscle. So Nina is actually a prime example of someone who could successfully focus on a body recomposition, which is losing fat and gaining muscle at the same time. This is possible for someone who, like her, is new to this consistent style of training. And it's possible for a few reasons, including the body's inclination to respond quickly to a new training stimulus. Um, it also initiates nutrition partitioning, which is a fancy term for the body prioritizing mu muscle growth over fat storage. And it increasingly, um, she's able to increasingly improve metabolic adaptations for muscle gain, which also leads to fat loss. So there are a couple of things going on when you're in this scenario, when you haven't been lifting really consistently or following a structured program for years, um, that makes it possible and more likely that you're able to uh, participate in a body recomposition. So her goal is possible. It's good news. So some specific uh, nutrition recommendations for Nina. Now, I would likely suggest that eating at maintenance or at a very small deficit, um, we would want enough energy to build muscle. Remember, that's part of this goal, but also um, help prioritize fat loss with a slight deficit. And we want to keep these calories as high as possible for as long as possible, especially because Nina is a 33-year-old female. And so hormonal balance is very important and we don't want to compromise that. So we don't need any crash diets or anything crazy. Um, she's probably going to see some progress eating, you know, as she as she has been, um, assuming that is her maintenance level of calories. So again, we would want for her to prioritize protein. So because she's trying to build some muscle um, and ensure adequate fat and protein and fiber to promote fullness and satiety. Um, and that's especially important if she's in that deficit, we want to make sure that she is, is feeling full and satiated. I might also pay attention to sugar um, consumption and help stabilize blood sugar, um, not just cycling through uh, energy peaks and crashes. I would also encourage her to fit her wine consumption into her overall nutrition plan, um, making sure that it doesn't you know, send her way over her energy needs for the day um, and compromise her, her careful nutrition that she is focusing on elsewhere. So again, it's totally possible to fit all of that in. Uh, it's just a matter of considering it as a part of the overall diet there. Next, we would think about timing. So these would be pretty close to the same recommendations for Wayne because she is going to be um, initiating a more structured training program. She could play around with training fed versus fasted um, and would definitely want to make sure that she's prioritizing that post-training um, protein and carbohydrate. Um, she could consider maybe working out a little bit more fasted since part of her goal is to prioritize body fat. Um, but again, it's, it's not going to make a huge difference there. The other considerations for Nina, uh, the most important factor is going to be consistent and progressive strength training. Now this is really, really important if fat loss is ever the goal. Um, and that's because when we're talking weight loss, the body does not differentiate on what tissues it is losing, which means you will lose both muscle and fat, which is not what we want to do. That does not create her goal, which is to be toned, right? Um, so training consistently and progressively, you're telling your body, hey, I need this muscle. Hey, I need this muscle. And the body then preserves that muscle um, and isolates as much as possible that fat loss. Next, we want to prioritize um, NEAT as well, so that non-activity um, exercise. And that is especially important because Nina works a desk job, so she's probably not moving as much as she thinks every day. So watching your steps, you've probably all heard the kind of aim for 10,000 steps a day. Um, doesn't have to be that number, but making sure you're getting a lot of movement throughout the day is a really good way to measure this. 
Um, she could also add in some zone two cardio, which that's when your heart rate is um, about 60 to 70% of your maximum. And that can help promote fat loss as well. So I would add in a couple of these activities for her, make sure she's prioritizing um, that consistent and progressive lifting plan. And then of course, very important, prioritizing sleep recovery and mobility. Okay, finally, we have Trixie, our triathlete. So Trixie is regularly competing in events. She is running distances several times per week, and she occasionally lifts weights or does Pilates. Now, her goals are all performance-based. Um, in contrast to building muscle, like our other two athletes, Trixie wants to improve her time on an event. So we want to set her up with nutrition that supports her optimal performance. So Nutrition-wise, it is still important that Trixie prioritize protein. Actually, endurance athletes tend to undereat protein relative to weightlifters, but it is still a really vital um, to, component to preserve strength, especially um, when you're upping the volume of this kind of catabolic activity, which is running. Um, she also needs adequate carbohydrates for energy as well as fats for her overall health. Um, and especially her joint health. So she's doing a high impact exercise. So we want to make sure that her joints are lubricated and fat um, consumption can help do that there. As far as calories go, go, she hasn't indicated any body composition goals. So maintenance calories would be appropriate. But note that when she's assessing, you know, what is my maintenance? Um, it may be relatively high given the amount of activity that she performs. So she would want to personalize that obviously to her, her training. As far as timing goes, there are more specific recommendations for endurance athletes than for um, the others that we've looked at so far. And this is largely due to the amount of time that they are exercising. So if you exercise, let's say run for 90 minutes or fewer, your body actually has enough glycogen. Remember, those are the stored carbohydrates in your muscles to provide the energy that you need. Um, and so you don't need to worry about consuming a bunch of excess um, carbohydrate to support that, that training session. Now, if you have an event that is greater than 90 minutes, you may want to consider a couple of things. So before the event, um, one thing that many people do is something called carb loading. Now, contrary to popular belief, this doesn't just mean eating a ton of pizza the night before an event. That can actually cause digestive issues and a big blood glucose spike and dip and leaving you with less energy than maybe you would have had otherwise. So to do carb loading properly, you actually um, need what's called a glycogen depletion event, which refers to a period of reduced carbohydrate intake. Um, that's one to three days before um, your actual event. Um, and you could accomplish that by maybe increasing your physical activity, doing something like HIT, something that's aimed at depleting glycogen stores in the muscle. And the purpose of this is to signal the body to increase its capacity to store glycogen. Um, now, by depleting glycogen stores through exercise and dietary manipulation, the body becomes more efficient at storing glycogen through during the subsequent carb loading phase. And then you have more glycogen stores um, during the event and you can go longer or train longer without um, needing as much nutrition support. So this is a common practice, um, although, you know, usually it's done incorrectly, but if it is done properly, you know, it's important, it, it can be effective. Um, it is important though, to weigh kind of the benefits um, of doing this because it is taxing on your body uh, before an already taxing event. And it can have an impact on blood sugar levels if you deplete glycogen in the liver significantly. So the other thing you want to ensure, obviously, is proper hydration going into the event the few days beforehand, making sure your body is, is really hydrated. Now, during training, so you want to ensure that you're providing the body with adequate glucose, because remember, those glycogen stores have now been depleted because you've been training um, for longer than 90 minutes. So you have, have to provide uh, glucose um, along with electrolytes. So you can use you know, glucose gels, they're really common in, in kind of the running community or another form of glucose. Um, sometimes though, like eating crackers and things while you're running or, or not, it kind of can upset your stomach and not feel great. So gels are an option. Other forms of glucose are an option. Um, you also want to make sure you're consuming water with the glucose. When I say glucose too, I'm talking about carbohydrates, like fast acting carbohydrates. Um, so you want to maximize how fast that is absorbed by consuming it with six to eight ounces of water. Now for electrolytes, 
there are a lot of brands on the market, like noon tablets, base salts, elements, um, things like that, um, that you can consume. And it's important also to make sure that your water is including electrolytes throughout your training because um, there is a risk of something called hyponatremia, which comes from drinking way too much plain water without, without electrolytes. And that actually dilutes the electrolyte balance in your entire body. And this can have really dire effects um, on your nerves, your brain. It can be a really serious condition. So make sure that you're consuming water with electrolytes throughout your, your training, um, as well as glucose periodically. Now, after training, maintaining hydration with electrolytes, um, at least for 24 hours after your training cycle, it's important to just keep those balanced and up. Um, and then similar to weight training, you are going to want to replenish those protein and glycogen stores again with that four to one ratio of protein and carbohydrates. Okay. So we've reviewed specific strategies and considerations depending on certain goals. And within those strategies, you probably noticed measurements like one gram of protein per one gram of body weight, or really precise ranges and slight calorie surplus and deficit and all of these kind of technical um, recommendations. And I get this question a lot about, you know, do I have to track my calories or measure my food um, to reach my goals? And the answer is no. Um, slash it depends. So really the more precise your goal is, the more precise your process is going to need to be to reach it. So if you're trying to hit a bullseye, you're going to need to consider the wind, where you're standing, the kind of arrow you have, the weight, um, all of those things. If you just want to hit somewhere on the target, then you may be able to just kind of quickly aim and shoot. So if you're trying to achieve, achieve very specific body recomposition goals, um, for example, that may require spending some time being aware of what you're eating. Now, weighing and tracking food would be the most precise way of doing that, but there are also other methods that may be appropriate. If say, you know, if someone has a, a history of disordered eating, that is obviously not going to be the recommendation. Um, but if your goal is related to performance, like hitting a new PR in your sport, um, you know, tracking food is probably not necessary and you're probably better served by adopting a few general recommendations uh, and strategies like we talked about, like eating enough protein. So it all depends on your goals. Um, like I said, if you've got very specific goals, like I want to improve my muscle percentage by 10%, you're probably going to have to get pretty targeted with your methodology there um, versus if you just want to, you know, improve your performance overall. So, all right. Next slide, please. So how should we assess progress as you go? Now, a lot of times people focus on weight, but there are a ton of other metrics that you can look at that are just as valid. So performance goals being one, um, are you achieving a new PR? Are you consistently progressing in your workouts? Those can be great indicators of making progress. Um, you can look at weight. Uh, it might go up for building muscle. It might go down when you're losing fat, or if you're doing a body recomposition, you're probably not going to see a change in weight at all, which can be again, really frustrating and maybe, um, or support looking at these other metrics to assess your, your progress there, because weight is not going to be a good indicator. Um, you can take a look at body measurements. Um, you can do these periodically every couple of weeks. That can be a good indicator. Think about how your clothes are fitting, you can look at um, health metrics, so lowered A1C, blood pressure, improved cholesterol, all of those things obviously indicate um, not athletic performance, but improved overall health, which can come from uh, focusing on good nutrition and fitness. And then if you, again, have some of those really technical goals, like I want to improve my muscle percentage by 10%, you can look at something like a DEXA scan or an in-body. Those are really, um, you know, very precise ways of measuring body composition. It will tell you muscle percentage, bone, fat, um, water, all of those, those things. And it can be fascinating if nothing else, but also a good, a good tool if you are looking to be more precise. All right. So making eat well, eating well, practical, how do we do that? 
My, ve- my best advice here is first to make it personal by meeting with a registered dietitian who is going to be that nutrition expert who can take a look at your goals alongside your health history, your preferences, your budget, your schedule, and provide a plan that's specific to you. So maybe you're like Nina and you're having trouble seeing progress. Your dietitian could assess what specifically you've got going on and help you come up with strategies to address those things while helping you stay accountable. So again, be sure to look into scheduling a visit for as low as zero dollars and use the code athlete to enter to win our $250 giveaway. As far as general steps to kind of take and apply with what we've learned today, uh, I would start by getting clear on your goals. Are you a Wayne, a Nina, a Trixie, or are you a you and you have your own specific goals? What are those? I would take a look at your current nutrition habits and say, are they working for you against your goals um, or are they working against you? So take a look at, at those. Identify a couple of areas of opportunity and are there things that you're eating too much of, too little of, are things unbalanced, are things not working for, for the goals that you just set? Write down your plan. How will you cons- stay consistent? How will you measure progress? How will you know when you've actually reached your goal? Um, all of those things are important to kind of set at the, the beginning of um, your goals to know how you're doing along the way. Plan for failures. Um, things are going to come up. You're going to have vacation. You might get sick. Um, you may just be craving an entire cake. Um, have a contingency plan about how you're going to adapt and how you're going to get back on track. And finally, find your accountability partner, like a dietitian. Um, it is helpful to have someone knowledgeable who can say, hey, looks like things went off the rails a little bit. Um, Here's how I think we can get back on track. And then finally, remember that that fitness and health are lifelong sports. Um, It's not about short-term anything. It is about doing most of the things most of the time and also moving in the direction of, of prioritizing good nutrition, fitness, and healthy habits. So with that, um, that concludes kind of the meat of our, our presentation. I know this is a lot of information. I've seen some of the comments come through about um, getting these slides later. We have been recording this and this will be on our YouTube channel in the next couple of days. So you'll be able to rewatch it there. Um, but it looks like we have a couple of minutes for questions. So I'm going to open up the chat and just kind of sift through. All right, let's see. Examples of an after-training snack or meal. That's a great question. Um, so the easy one is a, is a protein shake with some kind of carbohydrate. So you could add um, a scoop of whatever protein you like with, let's say, a banana or some other kind of fruit. That would generally be close to that four-to-one ratio. Um, it doesn't have to be a protein shake. It could also be just a normal meal. You could work out and then have breakfast and have your breakfast be high in protein and include a little bit of carbohydrate. That's totally fine too. Um, that, yeah, that's what I would say. I wouldn't overthink it. Just make sure that you're eating generally protein rich meals, um, throughout the day and eating relatively soon after training. Good question. Let's see. Lots of questions coming in. Um, so fast that they're moving all the questions up. Let me try to read one. Are there any caveats for those looking to do intense exercise after 60? Without having more information there, I would say, what does intense mean? Slash no, probably not. Um, Just based on age, like I said, you can build muscle really at any age. And so prioritizing good nutrition and fitness at any age is, is a really good idea. All right. Is hyponatremia of concern for non-triathletes? Should glucose and electrolytes be on the radar for folks who are more like Wayne the weightlifter? It's a good question. Um, it's not really the same concern. Um, it's again, related to the time that you're training. So if you're weightlifting for three hours, uh, yeah, you might want to include some glucose. You certainly wouldn't want to be doing that fasted. Um, and including electrolytes, especially if you're sweating a lot or if you're in hot, humid environments is a good idea generally when you're training. But I wouldn't be 
in a general kind of weightlifting session that's typically around 45 minutes to an hour, you're probably good to go um, as far as glucose. You don't need to eat mid-training session um, because your body, remember, has glycogen in the muscles enough to support that um, those needs throughout that duration of a workout. But again, you can also, you can include electrolytes. That would be the one thing if you're sweating a bunch that sure, you could, you could take that throughout your workout, no problem. All right, let's see. <laughs> what if you want to be a Wayne, a Trixie, and a Trixie hybrid? Uh, go for it. You know, these were really narrow examples just to talk about specifics. Um, they're against very targeted goals and targeted nutrition approaches, but if you are a weightlifter, this is very common, right? Someone who lifts weights more regularly than once a week and also goes for a couple of runs, that's totally fine. Um, I would consider the nutrition, consider both of those nutrition considerations in that case, which if you recall, there was some overlap. So you would, if you're doing longer training sessions, want to consider including some sort of glucose support and um, electrolytes for sure. And then also including making sure you're eating enough, I would say, overall. So certainly not in a deficit. If you're both running and lifting weights consistently, you want to give your body the nutrition support that it needs. So that's a that's a good question. All right. Um, what type of protein powder? Doesn't matter. It's up to you. There's lots of good plant-based options. There's some good whey protein powder options. As long as it is a complete protein, which most proteins are, that is what matters. Peanut butter, a good source of protein. It is, but when we're thinking about macronutrients, um, I didn't touch on this a ton, but most foods are not one macronutrient. They're usually a combination of all three. So there's some protein and some fat, mostly in peanut butter. It's actually going to be, if you're trying to isolate it as one macronutrient, it would be more of a fat in my opinion, and you might get a little bit of protein boost. Um, but peanut butter is delicious and you should still eat it unless you're allergic. <laughs> All right. Got a couple more here. Lots of questions about meal replacements. Um, you know, I, it depends, right? It depends on a lot of things. If there's something you're really into for other reasons, like time or cost savings, like they're okay. But generally when we're thinking about Remember, we're, when we're thinking about overall health, we're looking at both calories and nutrients. So while a meal replacement by have those things. It's missing things like fiber. Um, it's missing a lot of those micronutrients potentially. And so I would always, where possible, opt for whole foods most of the time. And again, back to the kind of end recommendation there, it's doing most of this most of the time. So if meal replacements make sense for you um, for whatever reason, then, you know, that's, that's how this stuff gets personal. Ooh, Bob just ran the Boston Marathon. Very cool. And did quite well in preparation of the race. Was very helpful seminar. Gave you good information. Glad, glad to hear that. Um, also saw someone say that they loved pizza and they were uh, sad about <laughs> my comment about pizza and carb loading. You can still do that, right? It's just that you need the glycogen depletion event first in order to deplete the glycogen in your muscles and then refill it with pizza is fine um, or pasta or any kind of carb heavy meal. So wasn't saying no no to pizza, just how you do it. This question about creatine. Um, so yeah, creatine is it's probably the most well-researched supplement when it comes to weightlifting. A lot of people will say that it makes you gain weight, but what it actually does is pull water into the muscles, which can actually be really beneficial um, so, you know, as far as I know, as far as the research that I'm aware of, creatine is generally relatively safe. I think the the baseline recommendation there is five grams or milligrams, read the label, um, a day. So of all the supplements, I think creatine is, is an okay one. Let's see. Gosh, so many questions. I wish I could save all of these. Um, okay. This is a good question. So 
in response to someone's question about being a Wayne and a Trixie, um, someone asked that whether they should focus on one goal versus or first and then the other or continue to be hybrid. It's an interesting question. So they're basically asking, should I first focus on weightlifting and then focus on um, my endurance or can I do them both together if their goal is to get to a, a healthy BMI? So if the goal is a healthy BMI, um, assuming that's not the case based on this limited information, um, I would say focus more on being a Nina, right? So Nina is incorporating a lot of weightlifting into her routine in a very structured way. And she is also incorporating more than Wayne, but less than Trixie, some cardiovascular um, training. So I would say that is kind of the good recipe if you're trying to both build muscle and lose fat, which it sounds like this person is at the same time, you're not going to want to do too much of one or the other thing. Um, there are other philosophies like uh, in you know the bodybuilding world where you may want to cycle through periods of intense uh, muscle building and periods of um, losing fat. That's another way to do it. But I think, again, if you're new to training, it's possible and healthier to focus more on a body recomposition by just adding in some structured weightlifting and um, upping your cardiovascular training a little bit without going full endurance. All right, I'll take one more question. Let's see. Hmm, okay. This is a very specific question that I will address. So this person says um, their total daily energy intake, so going back to that formula, is about 2,800 calories. They are 6'2", 195 pounds. They've started counting calories because they realize they overeat very easily, up going above like 3,500 calories a day. Um, their goal is growing muscle while losing fat, so body recomposition. Um, they lift four to five times per week for the past few months. Other than a calorie deficit, what else can I do to help reducing excess fat around my stomach? I'm around 20% body fat. So thanks for sharing all that information. Those are all the kind of points that I would, would want to know, right? So first I would want to know this, your, what are you doing? What are you eating at now? If your total daily energy intake is 2,800 calories, is that what you're eating? And how is your, um, if you've been only training for a couple of months, what has your weight been doing over that time? Have you noticed increases in performance in the gym? Has your weight been going down? Um, have you noticed any, your clothes fitting differently? Sometimes when you're, um, goal is again, both reducing fat and growing muscle. You're doing a body recomposition. You're not going to see the scale move a bunch. Um, but you also can't spot reduce fat. So I would, my basic advice would be keep going. It sounds like you've only been doing this for a couple of months. Um, body recompositions take time and they take time to see progress. Um, and by time, you know, people are like, Oh, a couple months can be like six months to a year, which is like, you know, again, this is a lifetime sport, but, um, yeah, I would say give it a little bit more time. Um, you could try, you said you didn't want to do a calorie deficit or other than a calorie deficit. You could do diet cycling. You could do a calorie deficit for a short amount of time, um, and then increase your calories and see if that makes a difference. Um, so there are a couple of strategies you can play around with, but, um, yeah, I would just generally say, keep going. Okay, that was a little complicated. I will take one more question since we've got a couple more minutes. Hmm. Let's see. Okay. Um, any advice on sugar and alcohol cravings? This is kind of related. It comes up a lot, I think, in the context of these conversations because they are, they can be addictive substances. And so you do, many people do have cravings for these things. Um, 
I have a lot of recommendations for sugar cravings. Um, and that kind of, they kind of tie into some of the recommendations around prioritizing protein. I would say one thing you can do is starting your day with a protein rich breakfast rather than something that is sweet. It's just such an easy thing and it sets your body up for stable blood sugar throughout the day. So I would always say that helps a ton with sugar cravings because if you start with something sweet, you're on that cycle kind of um, all day long. So I would say that is one thing you can do for sugar cravings. For alcohol cravings, you know, that's a much larger conversation, but I will say alcohol can fit into these plans, right? It's just, again, considering it in the context of the overall calories and nutrients, because what you're doing when you're consuming alcohol is you're sacrificing calories that you could be eating on more nutritious foods. And there's a time and a place for that. Again, this is not any hard and fast rules. There's a time and place for enjoying alcohol here and there, right? But that's it. If if your goals are very specific related to performance or body composition and you're following and you're putting effort into this diet, by consuming alcohol, you are giving up those calories that could be spent, if you will, on other, you know, proteins, fats, and carbs that are going to support your goals um, more than alcohol might. All right. Um, well, there's so many questions in here that I could probably spend another hour answering them, but I really appreciate all the engagement uh, on this webinar. Hopefully it was really informative. Um, again, this is baseline general information that you can certainly take away and, and apply to your own scenario, but working with someone specifically one-on-one -on -one to really tailor these recommendations to you would be um, a really good next step. So encourage you all to do that. And yeah, thank you for attending. Um, hope you all have a great day.